Welcome to The Connecting Room. Good morning. My name is Landon. I'm um, on staff. I'm your youth uh, pastor. Um, I know you don't 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 really see me, but um, hey, I I um I I am here. I promise. Uh, we uh, had a disciple now this weekend. It was a little bit different. Uh, number one, because it actually took place here. Um, and number two, uh, the whole church w was involved. Uh, that was my main goal, is, is, is the youth. They are the future of the church, but as our pastor said, said guess what? They are, they are also the church of today, and we all should be involved. And when a church gets excited about their youth, when a church gets excited about their children, the sky is the limit. Amen? So, uh, youth, if you, if you were glad to be here for Disciple Now, can I get an oh yeah? Uh, church, if you're excited to be here today, can I also get an oh yeah? Oh yeah. Really? S again, please? Give it to oh me. Yeah. Really? One last time. Say it. Oh there yeah. we go. Oh yeah. There we go. Uh, so let me tell you a little, a small bit about our disciple now before I introduce our speaker today. Uh, it took place here, um, like I said. Um, and the theme was, can anybody guess it? Impact. Impact. Uh, and some of you may go, go, hey, uh, that's our church's theme, right? Yeah, of course it is. And for some reason, I just couldn't get away from it. God had so laid it on my heart. And I just ran with that for the youth. Because, again, we all are the church, right? Uh, so the theme was impact. And it really, uh, uh, Bobby said this last night. And I think it really sums up what, what the weekend was about. And, and he said this, and it's really profound. He said, if you aren't a Christian, stop at, um, acting like one. And that really sums up the whole weekend. Was If you aren't a believer, then stop acting like you are. Because you aren't doing Christ any good. The church any good, right? Uh, and like I said, the whole church... Sorry, the whole church was involved. We had um, adults who were small group leaders. We had um, host homes, and and they were all from different um, uh, age groups. Uh, we we had different connect groups who served um, food, um, meals. We had different connect groups who help who helped out the host homes with food. We had different connect groups who helped transport kids back and forth. And let me tell you, tell you this. I love you, and my fam, my fam, my family does too. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, so let me introduce to you to let me introduce to you our speaker for the day. I've known this man for probably about fifteen years now. Um, ever since I was probably about twelve. Um, his name is Bobby McGuffey. He is the Associate Pastor, Youth Pastor at Flowood Baptist Church in Flowood, Mississippi. Um, and he's going to come up and give us our message today, and I will let him fill you in on a little bit more uh, about himself. All right, so Bobby, come on, brother. Good morning to you. I'm a youth pastor in Mississippi, and I'm just an ignorant redneck that loves Jesus. And... Um, and just to tell you a little bit about myself, I surrendered to preach when I was 15. I was a sophomore in high school. God called me to preach, uh, getting ready to go to a youth revival one night, and it was evident. And so I surrendered my life to Jesus at 15 years old, and I was licensed to preach then. And I had great pastors walk alongside me. My, uh, my brother surrendered to the ministry when he was 21. He's a pastor in Louisiana. He's on the Louisiana Baptist Convention and a member of the Louisiana College uh, Board of Trustees. And, and so we've had people that's come through our life that has mentored us. My mom and dad divorced when I was three. My brother was nine, but my mom has played the piano 
uh, my whole life, uh, from the Gaithers to uh, the Blackwood Brothers to the Kingdom Mayors to whoever. So I was raised in, in church. Uh, I, I'm old school, traditional. This is the first time in my life I've ever worn a t-shirt on Sunday morning. Um, <laughs> But your pastor said I could, okay? So, uh, yeah, I'm just used to wearing a suit. Uh, but anyway, uh, I'm married. My wife, Lindsay's here. She's from uh, Franklin, Indiana. And uh, there's three things that I love to do. I, I love to preach the gospel. I love my wife, and I love to play golf. Uh, and so they own a golf course, and that's one of the reasons why I married her, because I get the benefits of that. Um, but uh, a little bit about us, we got married back in 2012 in Indiana, uh, just south of Indianapolis. We got married up there, and, and if you're, you may be from Indiana, that's okay, but there's nothing as good as the south. And uh, so we got her down here learning, learning how to make cornbread and not jiffy out of a box and, and that kind of stuff. So uh, we're making progress, but uh, she and I, I uh, we've been trying to have a child for, for, you know, we've been married almost four years. We've been trying to have a child, and the doctor said it probably wouldn't happen, and and, uh, you know, some major deals there, and she had a surgery, and, and uh, I can tell you that our God's sufficient, and in His time, and, and we were 10 weeks pregnant, so, or almost 10 weeks pregnant, um, uh, so, it's a, uh, <coughs> well, she's 10 weeks pregnant, okay, uh, and so, and so anyway, I, I've just enjoyed to be here, I went to college, went to seminary, got a doctor degree, and all that stuff junk that you're supposed to have in Baptist land and, and, and that kind of deal. But uh, anyway, I just love, I love preaching the gospel. And I talk a lot faster than most people from Mississippi, and I understand that. Uh, my first sermon ever preached, my grandmother sat in the back and she said, Bob, she called me Bob, you can't call me Bob, but she said, Bob, every time you get fast, I'm going to raise my hand. <laughs> my grandma never put her hand down. And, uh, and so... Uh, I, I get excited about it. I get passionate about it. And, and I, I love this God that I serve and the God that I surrender my life to preach. And I, I'm by no means perfect. Uh, I'm a sinner saved by the grace that you're saved by. Uh, but we're all called to share the gospel and be disciples and fulfill the Great Commission. I, I know that y'all, your theme for your church is, is getting fit and impact. And, and I want to talk about something that's not always preached in churches. I mean, it may be preached here, and you may have heard it two weeks ago, uh, but it's church discipline. If you have a copy of God's Word, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 18. And as you're turning there, I want to give you a little bit of background. You know, Jesus Christ called His disciples to follow Him. And some of the people that He talked to, they dropped their stuff immediately and began to follow Jesus. And some may have gave excuses. In the Gospels, you can see a story. Uh, it's called the, the Rich Young Ruler. And He says, look, what must I do? To have the kingdom. What must I do? And, and Jesus says, you know, you've got to fulfill the commandments and you've got to do this. And he said, but I've done those things. And Jesus Christ says, you're missing the most important thing, which is me. And so many times in churches today, I, I was raised in the church, as many of, of you have been raised in the church. And, and you can see the, the change that the church is having on the impact, uh, impact on the world. You can see that it used to be all about the church and everything used to revolve around the church. And everybody got excited about Jesus and everybody got excited about what God was going to do. And, and you had revival. Some of you are old enough to know that you had to stand outside and raise the windows because you had that many people there. And, and it may have went over 10 minutes and people didn't gripe because they understood the Spirit was moving. And who are we to quench the Spirit? Who are we to say, hey, preacher, that's enough. Shut your mouth. That's not what it's all about. And as we talk about this this morning, I want you to understand that this is one of those sermons, for me personally, it's a hard sermon to preach. It's one of those that, you know, if you're going to be a preacher, you've got to live it, right? It's what they always say. And so you try your best to do it. And so a little bit... When, when I was older, when I, when I turned 18, I started serving court documents and subpoenas. And, and a few years ago, I got licensed, I become a licensed private investigator. And, and so I do those things. And I, I, get, I get to come in contact with most people that's not excited to see me. And, and so I'll, I'll knock on their door at 6 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday, and I'll drop court documents on, it, on them. And, and they're not always, oh, hey, man, how you doing? It can be some other things. And, and, but, but sometimes it's an open door and an opportunity to share the gospel with people. So many times you, you understand that people, you know, they're divorced for whatever reason it may be. Maybe, maybe a parent lost their, their job and they're behind. And, and maybe they just feel like they just can't go on and the world is crumbling at their feet. And, and they're wondering what God's plan. The same thing I want you to understand is this. When Jesus Christ was on the cross, when Jesus Christ was on the cross, God was on the throne. The things that you're going through in your life that you feel like you just can't keep doing, the same God is still sitting on the throne. And so you need to understand you cannot define or limit an unlimited God. You should not be defined by a situation that you come in contact with, whatever it may be, because our God is sufficient and our God will see you through. 
In Matthew chapter 18, he talks about church discipline. And what he's talking about here, obviously, is a Christian to Christian. All throughout Scripture, you can see how we're supposed to act, and you can understand what we're supposed to do. In Proverbs 27, it talks about iron sharpening iron. In Timothy, it talks about be ready in season and out of season uh, to rebuke and reprove and exhort. And you understand that if we confess Jesus... And you understand that if you have the title as a Christian, you are to be different than the world around you. You understand that if you say you love this God, people should know you love this God, not just by the things that you're saying. If you miss Jesus in this life, you're missing everything. It, where we come from is, is a pretty big area, and it's just outside of Jackson, Mississippi. We don't, we don't live in Jackson. That's where they shoot each other every day. We live outside of Jackson. and, and, and in our, I'm being serious, but in our particular area... There's about 35,000 people with just in a few square miles of us. I'm talking like there's people everywhere. And, and, and kind of like, you know, not like Atlanta. Atlanta's like the spawn of Satan. But, and, you know, it's, it's, it's terrible. Uh, and, and so, but you, I was telling the teenagers, you leave our church on Sunday and there's a ballpark down there called Liberty Park. And there's like six ball fields. And I'm not trying to harp on ball, but I want you to understand for just a second. The chances, listen to me, parent. The chances of your student or your kid or your grandkid making it to the major league Making it to the NFL when they're playing six-year-old travel ball is highly unlikely. But the chance of them standing before Jesus Christ is something that you can bank on. Okay? It's something that you can, you can rest your hat on. So let's think about this for a second. If we expect our kids and our students to do something, parents, the charge starts with you. Deuteronomy chapter 6, it tells you to teach students generation after generation after generation. And so many people have got it confused. They think we bring your kids to the church and it's the youth pastor's job to babysit. That's not the calling of a youth pastor. The calling of the youth pastor is to preach the gospel and to nurture them and to lead them closer to Jesus. But it all starts in the house. It all starts in the home. Well, Bobby, you don't have kids. That's exactly right. I don't have kids. But I've been around teenagers long enough from split homes and looking at things that say, you know what, majority of kids want to learn from their parents. I need you to understand that. Major they may not tell you, hey, Dad, you're right, obviously. Or, Mom, you're right. I never did it. I just got popped across the mouth. But, I, you know, I just, I, I didn't do that. But students want to learn from their parents. So we do the child dedication, and you understand that. Here's the deal. The worst thing, one of the worst things you can say to your child is, uh, do as I say, not as I do. That's not biblical. It's nowhere in the book. You're the greatest witness to your teenager. I've been to many disciples now. As my wife and I have been talking about it since we've been married. We've done about 10. And I was figuring it up on the way over here. I've been a part of about 30, 32 of them, either as a student, a small group leader, or as a, as a pastor, doing the speaking or whatever. And this is the truth. I want you to understand this, church. I've never seen the involvement of any disciple now that I have this weekend. So you need to understand, this church is rocking. That's not a biblical word, but this church is rocking. And, and it's going the right way. And you need to understand that, okay? <clears throat> In Matthew chapter 18, it, t it talks about church discipline. And, and what I want you to understand is, you know, I don't know what you're going through in life. You know, I don't know what you've been through. I can give you a little bit of my testimony, which I will, to make it make sense to you. But he's talking to people who profess Jesus. And so many times, churches are busting at the seam, not in a good way, but they're busting down the middle because Christians aren't living a Christian lifestyle. It's because we get caught up in the things of the world. When we as a church, I want you to know, we're fixing to build a new church where we are, about 20,000 square feet, about $2.8 million. And, you know, and I can remember sitting in some of these meetings, and this little guy, no offense to if you're a little guy in the back, he's sitting there, and his wife raises her hands and says, what color is the carpet going to be? And I'm like, oh, okay, you're only 27, don't say anything, just sit there. So I'm sitting there. Then it comes, are we going to have chandelier lights or are we going to have can lights? <laughs> and so I'm just sitting there, and I, I'm very hot-headed, okay, just to let you know. Quick-tempered, that's my sin, just to let you know, and you have a sin too. But anyway, so that, that's my mistake. <laughs> and I, I remember sitting there about the third time she asked a question, and I finally just said this. You're not supposed to answer a question with a question. English teacher in here, I got that. But I looked back at her and said, what does it matter as long as we're reaching souls for Jesus? 
And so many times in churches, we get caught up in stuff that don't matter. We get caught up in stuff that absolutely don't matter. We wonder why the president's like he is. You may be farming, that's okay. You wonder why Congress and Senate like they are. You wonder why the world's going the way it is. And listen to me, I want you to understand this. In a short time I've been in the ministry, you can blame it on anybody else. And that's easy to do. But you know what? If you draw a circle and you get inside that circle and you fix that person in that circle, my friend, you'll experience it's revival and then it will flow to the people around you you got to worry about the people you got to worry about yourself before you worry about those around you Matthew chapter 18 if you have your that scripture there and we're going to start in about verse 15 and Jesus is talking and we all understand that he's the man and, and this is talking about when you have a problem with someone when you have a problem with someone, this is what you're supposed to do. But so many times, even in, I call it life in Baptist land, so many times in Baptist land, what we do is instead of going to that person, we go to the pastor and say, Brother Jason, people are talking, or people are starting to say this. When somebody tells me that, I just tell them, I don't want, I don't want to hear you. I don't want to listen to you. Because if they have a problem, the biblical thing to do is to go to them. And you wonder why churches are, are falling apart and doing these things. And you may say, well, I don't like the way Landon's doing this. Well, I don't like the way the pastor's doing this. Well, I don't like the way the deacons are doing this. Deacons don't run the church, by the way, the preacher does. I don't like the way this is happening. I don't like the way that's happening. And I look at people and I say, when is the last time you prayed for your pastor? When is the last time you prayed for your deacons? When is the last time you prayed for your Sunday school teachers? It's so easy to say he or she is doing it wrong because we're putting them up against us rather than putting them at the cross of Jesus. And we all understand we have filthy rags to offer. Matthew 18, verse 15, and it says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. And if it shall bear thee, thou, shalt, thou hast gained a brother. The first thing it tells you to do is to go personally. You've got to go one-on-one -on -one with somebody. If somebody's talking about you or making fun of you or belittling you or talking about your family or your mama or whatever you do over here in Georgia, whatever that means is you go to that person. Nowhere in Scripture, nowhere in Scripture does it say the first thing you do is go to your pastor. So oftentimes we say, Pastor, this is what I need you to do. This is what I need you to do. This is what I need you to do. And Jesus Christ is saying, hey, I am far more sufficient than your pastor is. So the first thing you got to do is you go. Well, how do you go? You go with the right attitude. You go humble. You go with humility. You go with meekness. You go with uh, gentleness. You go with kindness. It's so easy to go to someone and just jump all over them because they're not like you. It's so easy to say, well, how are you doing the alcohol? Or how are you doing the pornography? Or how are you doing this? By the way, just to let you know a stat that I read the other day, 60% of people of leadership in the church, 60% of leadership in the church deal with pornography. And so it is out there. It's big. You need prayer. And so the thing to do is to go to that person and discuss it and not talk about them around, behind their back. But it's so easy to do that. It's so easy to do it. So step one, it tells you to go personally. It tells you to go with, with uh, humility and meekness and gentleness. And, and here's the deal. If, if you go talk to that person, and that person says, hey, you know what, Rick, you're right. I, I messed up. I made a mistake. And, and you know what, I want, to, I, I want my life back with the Lord. What's the Bible say? It says, hey, you know what, you forgive him, and what? You gained your brother back. That's Bible. That's biblical. You go to them, you, you make it to them, you don't put them out there in a belittling way, but you say it in a way that you take their life, you put it up against the Jesus, and you understand that nothing we can do compares to who Jesus Christ really is. Step two, it says in verse 16, But, but if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more than in the mouth or two or three witnesses every word may be established. I'll give you a little testimony. My dad left when I was three, and he stands about 5'10", and. 40 pounds, just a little bitty dude. And, uh, and, and, and it was just, it was so hard growing up without a father. My, my, my father-in-law, he stands about 6'7", and he's a youth pastor, and he played basketball. He's from Indiana, and, and so obviously they're just the best in Indiana. But anyway, uh, go Duke. Uh, but anyway, they, they play basketball in Indiana. And, and anyway, and so it's just, it just fell right into place. But I remember my father sitting on the, on the, in the court, court one day, and we were sitting there talking, and he owed like $135,000 in child support, and being a preacher, that's a lot of money, all right? And so, uh, as looking back now, and I remember him talking about not wanting to pay for it. And, and so I was like, I just can't understand this. And so when I get a subpoena about child support, I hunt you down. 
I mean, I'll lay in your yard, I'll go to your workplace, I'll do whatever i got to do to drop these papers on you. Because, hey, here's the deal, that's the highest calling anybody can ever have, is to love their wife and to love their kids. Let's be honest. And so, I remember my dad sitting there and saying, I'm not going to pay it or whatever, some lame excuse, just because who he is. And then a few years later, in Piggly Wiggly, I shared the students with this, there's a Piggly Wiggly, and, and I see him, and I remember I'm hot-headed, a lot worse than I am now, and, and so I see him, and, uh, and I said, hey, Dad, or hey, Daddy, whatever I said, and he just kind of turned and looked at me, and this is what he said, God is my witness, who are you? And man, listen, I had just surrendered to preach, but I was like, I'm fixing to kill you. I mean, let's be honest. And, and I was like, uh, I'm your son, Bobby. And what he said, I don't have a son named Bobby. I didn't quite understand the whole turn the other cheek, but I turned his, you know what I mean? And uh, if you ever hit some, I'm not saying this guy's talking about hitting people from the pulpit, but if you ever hit somebody, you know, a long time ago, and you laid that good lick on them like Chuck Norris does the last three minutes of Walker every time, and, you know, he just roundhouse kicks them. But I remember my dad sitting there, and I hit that dude one time, and it was the best lick I ever laid on anybody. He just buckles, you know, and break his nose, knock a couple teeth out. I grab him by, by the head, and I'm just like, I don't want you here anymore, okay? And uh, long story short, a few months later, we're back in court, and I go to him, one-on-one. -on -one. He's sitting there. I say, and you know, I called him Danny. I wasn't going to call him Daddy. And, and I said, uh, hey, look, I'm sorry. I apologize. I just wanted to have a dad in my life. That's exactly how I said it. He looked at me and said, I'm, I'm through with you. Well, you know, here's the deal. If he's not a believer... Obviously, Matthew chapter 18 is not going to work. I need you to understand. Matthew 18 is believer to believer. Matthew 18 is somebody who knows Jesus as Savior to somebody who knows Jesus as Savior. So step one doesn't work. What do you do? Step two tells you to take two or three people. And you know, so, so many times, if, if you've ever been, you know, one of, the, one of the downfalls, and I'm not knocking deacons, okay? I need you to understand that for just a second. But so many times in churches today, deacons have this mindset of my way or no way, or like the financial team, they'll say, it's our money. No, it's not. It's God's money, but whatever you want to say to yourself. But so many times as deacons, they think they run the church. I'm being honest, okay? And, and your pastor probably knows stories and can understand it. But when you understand what it means to be a deacon, you understand you're the lowest of lows. You're a servant. You're doulos. You're at the bottom of the bottom. You're there to walk alongside the pastor and walk alongside the church to be servants of the church. If you ever come to church with the mindset of, what can I get out of church? If you ever come with the mindset of, what can I get out of church? You're missing the whole point of what church is all about. It's about what God can get through you to the world. That's what it's all about. But so many times when you get to step two, you take what we call in Mississippi, your posse with you. And you take two or three people that you know has got your back. And you go talk to this person. And you just get in there and you slam them. And you just go out and I can't believe you did this. And I can't believe you did that. And, and just on and on and on and on and on. Regardless of what they did, you are just as wrong at that moment. If you ever want to practice church discipline, you've got to allow it to take place in your life first. You've got to understand, I've got to look at that person through the eyes of Jesus. And I've got to look at that person the way Jesus does. Thank God, God did not only choose a certain people. Thank God that God should die for all people. And Scripture says that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And there's people in churches today that believe in what they call Calvinism or Reformed theology that is killing the churches today. It's killing the Southern Baptist Convention. Why? Because people sit in the church church and they say they know scripture but they have no idea what the book says to them it's so easy to say i know what the word of god says i know what it means i know what this i know that but it's a difference of living the word of god than just talking about the word of god step two it says to bring two or more with you and it wasn't say. It says three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, oh, that's the next step. And so it, it talks about you come here in verse two and three, two or three people. And if it same thing as one person, if that person says, you know what, I made a mistake. It's over right there. It's over right there. Well, what do we like to do in Baptist land? We like to bring it up a couple months down the road. Do you remember when so and so did this? Do you remember when so and so did that? I can't believe this. Well, the next step is when it comes to the church. I've never seen this part. As a 27-year-old youth pastor, I've never seen it make it to step three. I've seen it make it to step one and step two multiple times. But in verse <clears throat> 17, it says that if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. 
But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen, heathen man, and a publican. So the next step is, after one, and then you got two and three, you bring it before the church. And what that means is, is you come, and it's not to stone the man or the woman. That's not what it's about. It's about them to understand their fault. It's about them to see what they're doing wrong, ask God to reconcile them, ask God to restore them, so they can understand repentance in the eyes of God, so that it can be different than when they came. And so many times the church gets lost in things that really don't matter. Everything that you and I face in life, the answer farts in the book. Everything that you're going to go through in life, you and I will face it in the book. You can find the answers and guidance in the book. And so it doesn't matter maybe what I want, and sometimes it don't matter what you want. What matters at the end of the day is that God is being glorified through the things in your life. That's what matters. Let's read a little bit further in verse uh, uh, 18. Verily I say unto you, so that whatsoever ye shall bind on earth and shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. When it comes to the church and you understand, hey, the church, look, here's the deal. They come, they ask for forgiveness. What do we do? We grant the forgiveness and we drop it. That's biblical. We say, you know what, my man? You came before God just as I did, a broken sinner in need of repentance. And we want to see you make the next step. But what if they do not take the decision of the church? What if they don't take the guidance of the church? What if they don't say, you know what, I'm going to do this. I want to make my life different. I want to change what I want to do. If, if they decide not to go with that, in Romans uh, chapter 16 it talks about, in Romans it talks about how you can remove them and, and, and cause them. Uh, you can say that they're, they're trying to cause problems in the church. You ever had that? You ever had somebody who caused problems in the church? I ain't asking you to raise a hand if you're that person. <laughs> but if you, ever, you understand what I'm talking about? Well, you, it, I, you know, one of the things, you know, in Baptist land, we have committees for committees. Right. You know, for committees. <laughs> like if we're going to have flowers, if we're going to have roses or tulips. Anyway, so, and, and so you, you get together and, and you sit there and talk about it. And we talk about all these things. And, and we talk about what we think we need to do for this church. And what the church needs to do, whether it be Summit Church or Florida Baptist Church or whatever other church in the world, is to bring people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But if you understand, if you ever study anything Southern Baptist Convention, you understand we've got a revolving door in the church. We come in, we dunk them, and then they leave. We come in, we dunk them, and then we miss the whole discipleship process. 85% of students between 19 and 23, when they graduate high school, guess what? They don't come back to church until later on in life. Why? Because most of the parents instilled in them the biblical principles of what church is all about. So parents, your work's never done. It never comes a time where you can say, I I'm through doing this. Or it never comes a time where I can say, I'm through. I can tell you a testimony, and I'll be through, of something that took place that I was involved in. Uh, we, we had a, a, a person that, um, they messed up. And people in the church were talking. And, and I remember people would come up to me, and, and, and I'm the guy that handles the confrontation. Confrontation don't really bother me. That's just kind of who I am. And so they'd come up to me and they'd say, well, can you see this and that? And so I would tell them, hey, look, go talk to that person one-on-one. -on -one. Well, they never would. And so I called this guy in my office. He's like 66 years old, okay? And he has made a mistake. He has, he has become unfaithful to his wife. I'm a 27-year-old youth pastor, and I am, I was, well, I was actually more nervous when I got married. I cried like a baby. But I was really, really nervous at this moment. And I start talking to this guy in Matthew chapter 18, and I say, look, People are talking. If it's not happening, great. If it is, boom. This is it. Need to make it happen. Hey, it's not taking place. Month later to the day, gets caught. Red-handed. All right, so now you've got to do step two, correct? So you bring two or three people in there, and we, and we happen to use our chairman of deacons, the chairman of personnel, and a couple other guys, and they start talking. And the plan was this. If he tells the truth, if he says that he has made him, this happened six months ago in the church that I'm at. I need you to understand. This is truth. The plan was, if he tells the truth and says, you know what, I've messed up, you let him restore his mess, uh, marriage, you let him take a sabbatical, you let him get in front of the church. That's Bible. But if he does not tell the truth, you've got to let him go. James chapter 3 talks about it. Sure enough, multiple times he was asked, he didn't tell the truth. Long story short, had to resign, been there 19 years, been in the ministry 40 years, made a mistake. We lost nine people. And I can remember... Hate mail. Has anybody ever got hate mail? I don't want you to raise your hand. But if, if you ever received a hate mail, that'll mess with your mind. 
The very first one I ever got, I framed it and put a little plaque on it and said my number one fan. That's, I mean, that's just boom. That's, that's just kind of who I am. But I remember one Saturday morning, my wife and I were at the house, or Saturday evening, and I hear a knock on the door, and it's one of our deacons and his wife. And he walks in, and sure enough, got a letter addressed to them, no return address, got to love cowards, right? And so we read it, and they just, they just hammering him. I mean, going at it. Let me tell you what good that does. Nothing. Nothing. It's so easy to pick up a cell phone and text somebody and say something, or send an email, but I'm going to tell you what I believe Matthew 18 says. That means one-on-one, face-to-face, in the presence of God, we're going to restore this relationship. And so my challenge to you this morning, as you continue with the new year, and y'all are moving on with the impact theme and doing this and that, here's the deal. You cannot be what God has called you to be if you have a grudge against your brother. You cannot be used by Almighty God if you have a grudge with somebody in this church. I, can't, I don't like this person on this side, or I don't like this person on that side. At the end of the day, you're not going to understand what it means to live a life in Jesus until you understand what it means to be restored by God and to restore the relationships around you. So if I was to give you a challenge, I'm almost done. If I was to give you a challenge, it'd be simply this. We've had teenagers this weekend that have made professions of faith. And, you know, that's just the beginning of their walk. That's just the start. Coming down and say, I need Jesus, that's just the beginning. But if you would like to do something for your kid, it would be it, the greatest thing that you can do is to allow them to let, allow them to see Jesus in the way that you handle your relationships around you, whether it be at the workplace, whether if you're like me and you have road rage and you come into Atlanta and some woman crosses from the left lane to the right lane talking on a cell phone, whatever it may be, let them see Jesus in you. Because here's what I can tell you. I talk about, I gave you the, the baseball illustration. I'm not knocking you if you play baseball. I played travel ball. We just didn't play ball on Sunday then. When some of you are kids, you didn't do anything on Sunday, right? You left, went home and ate lunch. You didn't do anything. If you thought about doing anything, your mom and daddy would just beat you across the head. But you understand, you, you understand that nothing in this life matters except what you do for the glory of Jesus. Nothing matters. If you want to get fit, you can, you can say the thing all day, every day. But if you don't know the one who can get you there, you'll never make it. If you don't know the one that can get you to that, you'll never make it. The, old, the, the saying is, you heard it many, many times, you can understand it and kind of grasp it. And there's going to come a time where your life's going to be over. And I believe, absent with the body, to be present with the Lord. If you don't believe that, I'm sorry. Well, I'll, I'll teach you later. But I believe that when the time comes, you're in the presence of God. And in the hometown that I'm from, Blandon knows about where I'm at, 18 teenagers killed last year, whether it be car wrecks or suicide. I lost two clients. I graduated with 36. I lost two in the last year. One shot, one committed suicide, one, one drinking and driving hit a tree. One thing that you can bank on, that if God does not come back in the rapture or call you home, there will come a time that you will stand face to face to Almighty God. And it doesn't matter if you sat in the same seat for 50 years. It doesn't matter if you gave $50,000 to the building fund. It doesn't matter if that pew's got your name on it. It doesn't matter if you've been teaching Sunday school for 50 years and now you're going to say, I'm through. That's not biblical. You're through when you're in the presence of God. It doesn't matter whatever stipulation you put on it. None of that matters. What matters is that when you stand before God, the blood of His Son covers you, friend. And if you do not know that Jesus, you do not know life. Amen. You do not know life. You do not understand church. You do not understand what it means to be a believer. How can we expect the world to be different? How can we expect the world to be different when the church looks just like the world? Thank you for joining us today. We want you to know that you are always welcome at the summit. We are located on Highway 81 south of Loganville. Sunday school is at 9 a.m. and worship is at 10.30 a.m. For more information, you can visit our website at thesummitchurch.com.